Adab, uh, welcome to Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, a webinar series uh, co-sponsored by the University of Exeter Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies and uh, Habib University's program in Comparative Humanities. Uh, in the academic year 2020 to 2021, Habib University's program in Comparative Humanities in the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies launched a fortnightly webinar series titled Islam After Colonialism. The series charted the dramatic transformations under the devastating global impact of modern apartheid colonial rule in the nature of Islam in South Asia across culture, religion, politics, society, and the arts. The decolonial question of alternative pasts and futures was an important part of Islam after colonialism, given that contemporary concepts and imaginations of history, re religion, politics, culture, and ethics remain hostage to the modern colonial heritage. This year, a new series, Decolonial Islamic sp Spiritualities, while remaining in a similar constellation of concerns and perspectives, extends beyond South Asia, as well as focusing in on the spiritual, ethical, and religious resources and potentialities that have been marginalized or obscured through the co-optation of religion, quote unquote, by colonialism and its inheritor, nationalism. Um, I'm very, very pleased uh, to uh, ask uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, uh, from the University of Exeter, who's the director of the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, uh, to uh, introduce our very exciting speaker today, Sajjad. Thank you, Norman, and it is a real pleasure. Um, uh, Liana is actually not uh, new to us in the sense that she did help us out last year uh, as a discussant in one of our, our seminars, but um, it, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Liana Saif, who is um, an assistant professor in uh, Western esotericism, uh, his, sorry, history of esotericism uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, before uh, coming to Amsterdam, she was at the Warburg Institute as well as the University Catholic de Louvain. Um, and uh, she's well known for the work that she does in uh, the study of the occult sciences and esotericism. And she's also author of a very influential uh, monograph which came out uh, a few years ago called The Arabic Influences on Early Modern Occult Philosophy. Uh, which is a, a study primarily of, of hermetic and astral magic and its influence on, on the West. Um, so as, certainly for those who are interested in, in the occult sciences, Liana will be extremely well known. Uh, there'll be people who know her from the reading group on that topic at the Warburg Institute over many years, going back a while. Um, and uh, just generally, if you're interested in, you know, what we mean by the occult and the esoteric and how we make sense of that within particularly in an Islamic context then Liana is the person to have a conversation with. Uh, today uh, the talk that she's going to give in some ways I think quite nicely follows on from our previous talk which was specifically on on Sufism. Uh, today it's uh, entitled uh, Decolonizing Balthania, Islamic Esotericism beyond corbinophilia and traditionalism. And I'm very much looking forward to it because um, I have a few of the, um, I, I have a stake in a sense uh, in this question, um, being uh, perhaps uh, arguably a corbinophile, but let's see how it goes. Um, so over to you, Liliana, uh, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and uh, um, thank you for, for you, Sajjad, and for Naman for inviting me to be part of this excellent series. And I'm very excited to be here on this podium to share some of my reflections on the meaning of botania and Islamic esotericism and the ways Islamic esotericism has been conceptualized in the 20th century, particularly in the thought of the traditionalists, especially René Guénon and the works of Henri Corbin. In addition to entanglements with responses to rejections of their frameworks. Uh, but I will share my PowerPoint. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, great, thank you. So my reflections on this are based on my research on Islam and esotericism in the last five years approximately, which resulted in two publications. 
The first one is what is esotericism, which formed the, which is an article that formed the introduction to a special issue on Islamic esotericism that I edited for Correspondences Journal for the Study of, of Esotericism. And the second piece is entitled that I did love the more to live with him, Islam and in the study of Western esotericism. That is a chapter in a volume entitled New Approaches to the Study of Esotericism published this year and edited by Egil Asprim and Julian Stuber. So I wrote on the subject as a result of engaging with and interrogating the historiography and theoretical frameworks in the field of uh, Western esotericism that has been at the forefront of the academic discussion of esotericism at large. In recent years, this field, the field of Western esotericism, has been confronted by the problems related to the cultural and regional demarcations it has adopted. This field is based on a long durée narrative that has the tendency to underplay non-Western currents, including ones that constituted major sources for it, through appropriation or reaction, such as Tantra and Sufism. In the second article, I tackled the ambiguous place given to Islam in the narrative of Western esotericism and the wider intellectual and historical complex that feeds the exclusionary tendencies. The two major components of this narrative within which Islam is usually invoked are the sanitization of Orientalist perspectives, and second, the reliance, or let's say over-reliance, on writings of Henry Corbin, the traditionalist and the perennialist, to describe mysticism in Islam as a whole. In the first article, I demonstrate that Bataniya, in fact, is an Islamic construct with a long history dating back at least to the ninth century, and it is based on principles, epistemological paradigms, and social orientations that were and are conceptualized and negotiated, and uh, uh, we will talk about this today as well. Concerning esoteric, the esoteric and esotericism in, from the perspective of Islamic studies, the use of the term has not been so reflective. So let's look at some of the meanings that have been in general attributed to the word esoteric. So it has become generally accepted to use esoteric and exoteric to translate batin and dahir respectively. According to Ibn Mansur's Lisan al-Arab, batin can signify the interior of things. Batin and dahir are among the names of Allah. Furthermore, each verse of the Quran is described as having a meaning that is batin, uh, that is concealed, requires interpretation, and dahir, that is manifest. Al-Batan is also used to describe that which is veiled from sight and imagination of people. And in this way, it is close to the Greek adjective esoteros, meaning inner and the part that is within. However, it was the French Sufi and developer of traditionalism, René Guénaud, to first speak of l'esotérisme islamique. And it certainly became closely associated with, with his ideas about Sufism. In a treatise entitled Islamic Esotericism, Genot writes, of all the traditional doctrines, perhaps Islamic doctrine most clearly distinguishes the two complementary parts, which can be labeled exoterism and esotericism. In Arabic terminology, these are the sharia, literally the great way common to all, and the haqiqa, literally the inward truth reserved to an elite. Esotericism comprises not only haqiqa, but also the specific means for reaching it. And taken as a whole, these means are called tariqa, the way or path leading from the sharia to the haqiqa, from the sharia to the haqiqa. And for Geno, esotericism is the same as tasawwuf. His construction of Islamic esotericism is the result of his belief in a rift between the primordial tradition of the Orient and the spiritually bereft Occident. For Geno, Islamic esotericism is a pure self-evolving tradition without foreign borrowings, while simultaneously being universal in the sense that all kinds of tradition and thuruk paths lead to the truth. Such a traditionalist construction of Islamic esotericism is also represented by Frithof Schon, whose universalist application is much more nuanced than Geno's. He writes, our tariqa is not a tariqa like the others. Our point of departure is the quest after esotericism and not after a particular religion, after the total truth, not a sentimental mythology. 
I think it's important to also talk about the Muslims behind the initiation of Sean and Gino into Islam and into Sufism. So Gino was initiated into the Sufi Shadili order by Ivan Ageli, taking the name Abdul Wahid Yahya. And he was also called Sheikh Abdul Hadi Al Aqili upon his conversion to Islam. He was a Swedish wandering Sufi, painter, and author. In 1902, he himself was initiated into the Al Arabiya Shadiliya Sufi order by the great Egyptian Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Yasul Kabir, who has been interested in the notion of Islamic universalism. Sean was initiated by Sheikh Ahmad Al Alawi into the Sufi Shadili order. He founded the Tariqa Maryamiya. And Ahmad Al Alawi, um, sorry, uh, was an Algerian Sufi Sheikh who founded his own Sufi order, the Alawiya. He was concerned about the problems of modernity facing Algerian youths and was critical of westernization. And I think one step towards decolonizing Islamic esotericism would be to do more thorough studies on the relationship between these masters and René Guénaud and Fitab Shon. <laughs> Geno and Sean thus cemented a traditionalist and perennialist view of Sufism under the term Islamic esotericism. This view has become influential to such a degree that many non-traditionalist scholars who became key authorities on Islamic esotericism wrote in similar terms. This is certainly true of Henri Corban, who is often described as a traditionalist despite his rejection of it. However, whereas Geno and Sean apply it to Sufism, Corban almost categorically refer to Shi esotericism that he views to be a Persian achievement. The earliest references that I know to Batan and Dahir translated as esoteric and exoteric is in an article written by Jay Layden entitled On the Roshaniya Sect and its founder by Zid Ansari, published in 1812 in the Journal of Asiatic Researchers. The Roshaniya are described as a heretical sect whose founder began as a Sufi, but, and I quote, diverged wider and wider from the pale of Islam, end of quote. The author of one of Leyden's Afghani sources reminds his readers that, and I quote, it is expressly stated in the fundamental books of religion that whoever asser asserts the shariat and haqiqa, the exoteric and esoteric doctrines of the law to be at variance is an infidel. The use of the Arabic term historically reflected positive, neutral, and pejorative senses, all of which pertain to esoteric exegetical practices and the occupation with hidden phenomena and truth. Regarding the positive, we see it in the following context, in relation to Greek wisdom on the dynamics of the universe, particularly. The physician Ibn Abi Usayba, in his Ayun al-Anba fi tabaqat al atiba relates that the wisdom hikmah of Empedocles, which he received from the wise man Luqman in Syria before settling in the lands of the Greek, is the foundation of the thought of the Batanis who were concerned with decoding his discourse. Among the Batanis, he includes the Andalusian mystic Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Masarra in the ninth century, who was occupied with the letter structure of a hypostatic emanative cosmos. The historical and geographer Abu Hassan Ali al Mas'udi in his Muruj al Dahab relates Plato's ideas on divine love and those of the Sufi Batanis, al Batani al Mutasawwiqa. In relation to Quranic hermeneutics in his exegetical masterpiece, Mafatih al Ghaib, Fakhriddin al Razi acknowledges, and I quote, that the science of the purification of the interior, or he calls it Ilm Tasfiyat al Batan is a branch of human sciences that seeks to make manifest the spiritual lights and divine revelations, end of quote. For him, the scholars of the esoteric ulama al-batan are the sages and philosophers, al-hukama, whose intellects are so advanced they are capable of comprehending what the scholars of the exoteric cannot. Regarding the negative use of the term, it is usually used to describe those who subordinate the exoteric, that is religious law, to esoteric interpretation, absolving themselves from practical obligations or seeming to their uh, 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 criticizers to be absolving themselves from practical obligations. 
Hajj Khalifa, for example, censures esoteric folk, Ahl al batin or the Bataniya, such as the Sufis, for seeming to him to drop the exoteric significance of the Quranic verses altogether and invest only in the esoteric meaning. Even the master mystic Ibn Arabi distances himself from those, quote, Bataniya who ignore in, the, in their interiorizations fi bawatinihim, the dictates of the law. And it is from this negative view of extremist exegesis that the term botaniya developed as a pejorative term attacking particularly the Ismailis, as we see in the works of Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah, who also dismisses the exegesis of Sufis as well. So to establish Islamic esotericism as a responsible construct for the study of historical and contemporary currents, especially after recognizing its historical reality, a self-conscious preliminary framework is needed and I proposed in my uh, first article, What is Islamic Esotericism?, to look at Islamic Esotericism in terms of four principles, two orientations, and two paradigms. The principles of Islamic Esotericism, based on uh, a huge survey, really, of text from the 8th century all to the day to, to our day today, uh, looking at Sunni, Shi sources together. Um, and looking at it as a historical construct that was homegrown, that was negotiated and contested for a long time. I came up with these four principles of Islamic esotericism. The first one is the exegetical principle. Islamic esotericism is pivoted on Quranic exegesis. The, Senec the second ep principle is the epistemological principle, which basically is that tension between intellectual or revelatory reception uh, of hidden natural and celestial phenomena, the divine realm, and the nature of the Quran. There is a third principle, which is uh, the eschatological principle, which refers to the personal or collective salvific investment through the enlightenment and perfection of the human soul or the restitution of a community. And finally, it's the translinguistic principle that demands the use of symbols and allegory. These principles do not exclude esoteric Islam of the traditionalist or Koban, but in fact comfortably includes them and their works as important moments of entanglements with the historical botaniya. This construct is not restricted to the Sufis either. It includes Andalusian letterists, Ismaili esotericists, the Ghulat, Hurufis, and much more. Though arguably the Sufis and the Ismailis have been the most successful in the globalization of an explicitly esoteric message of Islam uh, as a whole, but particularly the, the globalization of it. The first step in decolonizing botaniya is thus acknowledging botaniya as an established discourse ebbing and flowing between the two ends of a spectrum, at one end sharia ah, and the other haqiqa, and different groups fell on different places of that spectrum. Therefore, not only is Islamic esotericism a better category than mysticism, mysticism being homegrown and negotiated to this day, it is also loaded with tensions about power, authority, and legitimization, making it of deep relevance to Islamic politics and Islamic nationalism, whether that is by its relation to interpretation of law or legitimization of rule or negotiating modernity and Western identity formation. Somewhere in between these two, we can locate the impact of Korban and also the traditionalist. Before I proceed further, particularly looking at the work of Korban, I need to stress what I am not saying today. Again, what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Korban and the traditionalists are irrelevant or unimportant, or that perennialism must be expunged, or that it is illegitimate. And I'm not saying that Corbanism and traditionalism are mainly Western and Orientalist inventions superimposed on a passive East. I am, in fact, much more interested in the instrumentalization of Corbinian and traditionalist ideas in negotiating modernity and the place of Islam in it by non-Western agents, especially considering that the Batan is a fu fundamental to Islamic exegesis and theology, in addition to ideas of reform from Ikhwan al-Safa in the 10th century to the 20th century reform movements. Because of this, it is indeed regrettable that Bataniya is not better incorporated in Islamic studies program 
as a whole. The challenge then is in finding a balance between on the one hand, appreciating and recognizing the importance of the works of Orientalist scholars and traditionalists to the modern conceptualization of Islamic esotericism and institutionalizing the study of Islamic spirituality. And on the other hand, resituating and reclaiming Islamic esotericism from the epistemological and Orientalist biases that characterize the way Islam's botania has been conceptualized, especially in the 20th century biases that resulted from post-enlightenment values, the construction of the categories of science and religion, and the concomitant reifications of Islam. Decolonizing Islamic esotericism requires thus revisiting the canon of Muslim and non-Muslim authors that have been established in Western academia and scholarship. And this reclamation constitutes to a large degree a textual reordering originally intended for European ends. Of course, Henry Corbin and the traditionalists loom large in this context, since the Western loss of tradition to modernity was the motivation of Corbin's study of Shi'i esotericism and Guénon's study of Sufism. So what are the achievements of Henry Corbin? From his arrival in Iran, Corbin had engaged in an extraordinary amount of work an important result of which was the foundation of a series of text editions named Bibliothèque Iranienne in 1949. From 1946, he headed the newly founded Department of Iranology of the Franco-Iranian Institute. And from 1955 to 1973, Corban would be in Tehran each autumn in charge of the French-Iranian Institute's Iranology section. His appointment in the French Iranian Institute had been issued directly by the Cultural Relations Department of the French Foreign Ministry. Second, so, uh, the second achievement of Henry Corban is centering Shiism and Imamism in the discourse about Islamic esotericism, particularly post Guinea, by formulating religiously inspired hermeneutics or phenomenological analysis linked up with Iranian concerns for the legitimacy of Shiism in the face of modernity. And Western studies on Shi'i mysticism at that time were very sparse. The third achievement is globalizing esoteric Islam through the vehicle of phenomenology and representing it in different academic networks studying the spiritual and the esoteric. And this is represented in this famous quote by Corban, where he said, is not phenomenological research what our ancient mystical treatise designated as Kashf al-Mahjoub? the unveiling of that which is hidden. As Matthias van der Bos writes, and I quote, for Corban, the phenomenology of Iranian consciousness would open the doors of meta-history, the realm of spiritual events, end of quote. So at the heart of the decolonization of Islamic esotericism, it is necessary to look at the reception of Corban's ideas by Muslims, including politicians and intellectuals, and understand their agency in negotiating his terms and ideas. This will allow us to resituate Corban's work in relation to the historical construction of botany and Islamic esotericism, rather than treating them as second resources on Islamic esotericism by and large. We hadn't had a systematic study of botany in the first place in order to exercise this shift, but I feel more comfortable maneuvering these issues with the principles and paradigms that um, I have already looked at, which are definitely open for expansion and more nuance. But I hope it's a start. Nevertheless, it is more pertinent to look at Corbynism as a discursive element local to Muslims with global ramifications. This cannot be understood as merely transnational Orientalism, as used by Matthijs van den Bos. This tends to impute self-orientalization on Iranian actors, or how he puts it, and I quote, the complicity of Easterners and Westerners, end of quote. So what were Corban's politics then? So Corban was sent on a state mission to Turkey in 1939 on behalf of the Bibliothèque Nationale to search for manuscripts of Sohrawardi in the libraries of Istanbul. He had planned to stay for three months in Istanbul, but his visit lasted until 1945 because of the war. During these years in exile, Corban acted as guardian of the French Institute of Archaeology. 
In August 1944, the Bibliothèque Nationale issued another Ordre de Mission for Persia this time, and on 14th of September 1945, Koban arrived in Tehran to, and I quote, meet Sohrawardi in his homeland, end of quote. During the last four years of his life, which had been arranged through the mediation of Prime Minister Amir Abbas, right? <coughs> sorry, he has been as a guest of the Imperial Iranian Academy. Among its publication was the bilingual translation English and Persian uh, of uh, entitled Sophie Perennis, which dealt with universal gnosis and perennialism. So despite his activity in highly political institutions, Corban was convinced that politics are literally too much drama. He writes, the entire human drama is played out on the plane of gnosis and Gnostic consciousness. It is a drama of knowledge, not a drama of flesh. Sorry, where am I? Oh, I missed that. Despite this claim, we must consider how Corban left his philosophical fixations to nation-making politics. Yet Corban's alluring public identification of Muslim spirituality with Swedenborg, Templars, Martinism, and other esoteric European figures, while routinely disparaging the legitimate Islamic legal tradition, everyday living Islam as legalism, he fostered a modernizing new age spirit also among many Iranians. In the spring of 1957, in a broadcast to Iranian radio listeners, Korban urges them to seize the occasion of the Shah's development project in order to implement intellectual changes in Iranian higher learning institutions. Also key to understanding Korban's relationship to Iran, the Shah and politics is Arianism. In 1951, he published uh, Iran, Homeland of Philosophers and Poets, reiterating his meta-historical vision in which, I quote, Zarathustra is the prophet of the Aryans, who evokes also, I quote, the last great sovereign of Iran, Riza Shah Pahl, and what he calls the great drama of the Aryan nation, end of quote. Moreover, Korban's most powerful patrons were indeed the Shah of Iran and the American billionaire Paul Mellon. Corbyn also ignored the colonial developments of his times. To him, these were surface details masking an eternal essence that the modern world had grown blind to and forgotten. Corbyn has explicitly adopted reticence and silence as a strategy for which he problematically, I think, appropriates the notions of taqiyya and kitman as a veil. He writes, I learned the inestimable virtues of silence, of that which initiates call the which initiates call the discipline of the arcane in Persian Kitman. One of the virtues of the silent was to place me one on one, as it were, in the company of my invisible Shaykh, Shahab al-Din Yahya Suhrawardi. End of quote. And somewhere then between participation in politics and political reticence. Corban invents a new form of universalism that was intellectually open to different cultural traditions while condemning modern Europe's secular enlightenment heritage and promoted in its place an ecstatic imaginary spiritual East. And this is where the notion of Corban's notion of the metaphysical Persia becomes relevant. Corban's Iran is the unique portal to the universal and imaginal. He writes, by my encounter with Sohrawardi, my spiritual destiny in my passage through this world was sealed. This Platonism of his, of his expressed itself in terms belonging to the Zoroastrian angelology of ancient Persia, and in so doing illuminated the path I had been searching for, end of quote. He later adds, we are dealing with an Orient that one should not try to locate on our geographical maps. And he says, I believe that in the long run, the heavens above have granted me their favor and have allowed me to hold true and win that wager. That then is a brief overview of the career of the Orientalist philosopher and his decisive encounter with that Iranian land, end of quote. Meanwhile, for him, Europe is sick. Europe is sick, but fortunately not beyond repair. The disembodied Iranian Islam is how to heal the sick body of the West. 
So I have spoken about the historical construction of Islamic esotericism, the way Koban envisaged it in relation to Shiism, particularly Irfan and metaphysical Persia. I turn my attention now to some non-Western agents and their handling of Korban's positions and ideas. Because the second strategy of decolonizing Islamic esotericism is to pay attention to the negotiations of Korbanism among Korban's associates. And today I will focus on Iranian agents, although this situation could be explored in different contexts, for example, Pakistan in the figure of Muhammad Iqbal and many others. But I will focus on two players the estimable professor of Islamic studies, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, and the ideologue of the Islamic Republic, Ahmad Fardid, representing different points of the esoteric spectrum, especially in terms of political activism. So first I start with Sayyid Hussein Nasser. After receiving an undergraduate degree in physics at MIT, he obtained a PhD in history at Harvard. Nasser's thinking during this time was primarily influenced by Sean and Henry Coban. Nasser became familiar with the writing of Sean when he undertook the job of editing them. And in September 1974, Farah Pahlavi, Empress of Iran, commissioned Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who was head of the Farah Pahlavi private bureau at that time, to establish and direct the Imperial Iranian Academy of Philosophy. And it was Nasser who introduced Korban to Iranian religious scholars such as Alamat of the Body. In an introduction to a translated compendium on Shiism by Allama Tattabai, Nasser states that the works aim, and I quote, presenting Shiism to the Western world from the point of Shiism itself, end of quote. Although Nasser himself said that political Shiism stood opposed to a spiritual authentic Shiism, he did not adopt a trans-historical approach in the same intensity as Qurban, and didn't seek to whitewash Iran or Islam with such an approach and disembody it. Nasser here instrumentalizes the West for Eastern purposes, Qurban instrumentalizes the Orient for Western purposes. As Muslim esotericist before him, Nasser was interested and is interested in the interplay of revelation and intellection in attaining the truth lying at the heart of what he called traditional Islam. However, Nasser reclaims traditionalism as an inherently Islamic engagement. He writes, Sorry. Only during the past few decades has a new phenomenon appeared which necessitates distinguishing rigorously between traditional Islam and not only modernism, but also that spectrum of feeling, action, and occasionally thought that has been identified by Western scholarship and journalism as fundamentalist or revivalist Islam. But this earlier fundamentalism was more a truncated form of traditional Islam in opposition to many aspects of the Islamic tradition and highly exoteric but still orthodox, rather than a deviation from the traditional form. He rejected thus the notion of esotericism as deviant or as heterodox, who, and for Kurban, it was these that were Islam's legitimizing concepts. Traditional Islam, according to Nasser, also preserves Sharia. Traditional Islam, he writes, defends the Sharia completely as the, as the divine law, as it has been understood and interpreted over the centuries, and as it has been crystallized in the classical schools of law. Moreover, it accepts the possibility of giving fresh views on the basis of legal principles, as well as making use of other means of applying the law to newly created situations, but also always according to such traditional legal principles as qiyas, ijma' and istihsan. Moreover, for traditional Islam, all morality is derived from the Quran and Hadith, and in a more concrete manner from the Sharia. To substantiate this claim, he evokes the authority of Al-Ghazali and Sheikh Baha'uddin Al-Amri. In a commentary that could be reflective of some aspects of Corbynism, Nasser writes the following against the Islamophilia of Western purposes. For Western purposes, he writes, moreover, the various traditional schools of Islamic theology, philosophy, and science are evaluated in the light of the Islamic worldview. 
they are in fact seen as keys to the understanding of, uh, to keys to the understanding of aspects of the intellectual universe of Islam, rather than as stages in the growth of this or that school of Western philosophy or science, and hence seem to be of value by money scholars only because of the contribution they have made to modern Western thought, end of quote. This perspective is critical of presenting Shiism to the Western world from a purely phenomenological point of view that romanticizes it on the basis of a disembodied Islam and an Islamic borrowings. And I think this is very important in uh, nuancing uh, the conversation about even perennialism uh, and looking at the particular views even of scholars who do espouse perennial philosophy and this is why I did say before that it's not my concern to dismiss perennialism at all. And the second person that I want to uh, talk about as I mentioned was the uh, professor and philosopher and ideologue uh, Ahmed Fardid. Ali Mersapasi, in his work on transnationalism in Iranian politics, describes Fardid as envisioning himself as, and I quote, the spiritual leader of a cosmic involution, re-establishing humanity's ontological relation to divine will and being, end of quote. As with Korban, whom he knew, he shared a strong interest in mystical transcendent philosophy, particularly Shia and Sufi spirituality, and above all, mutual resentment toward the modern Western enlightenment. Fadid translated, in fact, one of Korban's works. This mutual affinity in thought becomes more complicated upon closely examining the relationship between Korban and Fadid. However, Fadid is far more influenced by ideas of Henry Korban than he ever acknowledged, although they were not fond of each other. Fadid reproduces much the same language in criticizing Corban as an Orientalist, who is in moral error, according to him, for simply thinking about Islam. He suggests that for a European to even think about Islam is an act of power and domination. And being a Western scholar of Islam, Fadid even accused Corban of being a member of the Freemasons. He writes, Islam is none of their business, whether they praise it or criticize it. These Orientalists are one of the problems of colonialism, infidelity and West toxification. For example, about Henry Corban at the beginning, I thought he was an honest person, but I discovered that he was a Freemason and an agent, end of quote. The targets of his criticism included the most, three most respected and well-known Persian philosophers, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Mullah Sadra. Fadid was tormented over the decline of quote unquote tradition and religious dominance and adopted a militantly antagonistic attitude towards all things modern coupled with an attempt to nurture a so-called authentically Islamic way of being in the world or as he puts it, Manawiyati Sharqi, Eastern spirituality. Therefore, for Fadid, this Eastern spirituality is distinct from Korban's Mashriqi Ishraqi complex. He promoted a kind of rebuttal to foreign influence, which culminated in attacking democracy as a mode of social organization inherently alien to true Islam, instead being uniquely European and even Greek. So between Nasr and Fardid, many more can be discussed in relation to politics, modernity, and the place of Islamic esotericism in them. We can talk, of course, about Allama Tabtabai, who often held study sessions with Henry Corban and Sayyid Hussein. We can talk about Ali Shariati, who was exceedingly political and used the spiritual language of religion to mobilize the Iranian youth against the Pahlavi state. Centering such debates on the historical Islamic construct, Bataniya, we are better equipped to undertake a genealogical approach, which uh, demonstrate the shifting attitudes among individuals and groups, negotiating the relationship of haqiqa to sharia and their socio-political relevance and positing Islamic esotericism as a better construct than the Christocentric mysticism. This will also help in resisting dichotomies that myths represent Islam, including political Islam versus uh, apolitical Sufism, constructing for Western strategies of domination and control. Thank you very much. Thank so you're you. done? Yes. <laughs>
Okay. Here we go. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. That was uh, very, very thought provoking. There are so many interesting. So that, um, uh, since given what you said earlier, I'm going to ask you uh, to go first. Yes. Um, well, thank you for that. And, um, uh, you know, of course, I, I said it was a Corbinophile, but actually not on this particular issue. In fact, <laughs> I, uh, I, um, I, I find Corbin's idea of Iranian Islam deeply problematic at so many different levels. Um, I think, uh, well, one kind of obvious uh, comment to begin with is uh, in many ways what we've been struggling with um, for some time when we've been doing the series, which is um, in any um, act of uh, decoloniality or decolonization, um, you've got the, the basic problem of language. Mm. And uh, terms such as mysticism, esotericism come up. Um, I think your your suggestion that esoter esotericism is a bit more adequate, because at least you can map it upon a term which um, is discussed and is considered whether positive or negative, i.e. botamnia, I think uh, certainly seems to be um, uh, possible. Um, I guess the 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 other point uh, one might want to think about is. Um, you know, how in a sense do we deal with the, the sort of related cluster of concepts that often come up? I mean, I'm not just talking about kind of Irfan and Ma'rifa, mm -hmm. uh, but also things like uh, uh, Ma'nawiya, uh, what is Ma'nawiya, yeah. uh, and so forth, uh, which of course is, is usually um, what's, what's going on. And, and in fact, um, I mean, you mentioned Tawa Tawai, so Tawa Tawai is interested in a slightly different kind of issue. So for him, mm. it's not about the, perhaps the, um, the privileged sense of, of the esoteric or the mystical, but rather um, the privileged um, level of the Ma'nawi, right? Mm. Mm. And, and the Ma'nawi for, uh, for Tawa Tawai is what is Hakiki. Right. So if you look at the, if you look at um, kind of Tabatabai's, what I would say Tabatabai's agenda, Tabatabai's agenda is a staunch defense of, I guess, what he would call metaphysical realism. That's right. the really important point. And right. metaphysical, metaphysical realism is basically a pushback against materialism. It's potentially a pushback against the left. Um, it's a pushback against all forms of atheism. Um, and it's about trying to uh, I mean, talking about the eschatological, it's about um, bringing uh, the imminence um, of uh, the existence of God into the cosmos in a way which is salvific. Right? Mm. Um, mm. So my, my point has often been that um, the philosophical text that he wrote, basically the punchline of all of them is that God exists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not actually done in, the, in in more traditional philosophy in Islam. You start with that position and then you move on, but he does it the other way around. He, he starts with the more general uh, metaphysics and he ends with the fact that God exists. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely the, uh, that's uh, what was being contested in the 50s and 60s and 70s Iran, uh, which, which was of significance. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, then the qu interesting question is, well, how do we make sense of, of where the esoteric fits into that? Um, and what one thing which um, sorry to kind of push this into Taba Tawai, but one thing no, which please is do because that, I didn't have the I, I said yeah. I would love to know more about. I mean, one one thing which is interesting about Taba Tawai is that um, what we know about his interest in the esoteric or the mystical, so to speak, is comes out of these private classes <laughs> that he held on uh, what in the in the tradition of the seminary was known as akhlaq, right? So akhlaq was the standard way in which you discuss these things. So, you know, we have some of these texts which have been published, uh, which are based on his, his uh, supposedly his teachings. And in that you get a sense of um, a, a, a personal spirituality, uh, a sort of personal um, training, uh, forms of ascesis, um, which are about uh, 
um, you know, sort of spiritual practices, uh, litanies, aurad, etc., but also are about contemplating the Quran, right? Contemplating the the, Qur the Quran the itself, Quran. right? Mm -hmm. And so that contemplation of the Quran alongside more formal exegesis. So the use of the Quran in those contexts is quite different for what he's doing in his tafsir. His tafsir That's is interesting. And so you see that um, in, in some of the, the shorter texts, um, which obviously published much later. And there's the, the other kind of question about how, how can we trust posthumous works in such a, in such a context, mm. uh, given the highly politicized nature of Iran after 1979. So, mm. um, so, so one of the interesting questions is, okay, so where is the scope of what is Batin? Where is the scope of what is Ma'nawi? Mm. Um, beyond uh, uh, the philosophical for someone like that and how does that really contrast with someone like Nas and Fadid? now you mentioned I think reasonably uh, in critique of Matthias's book um, you know that you didn't like this idea of the transnational orientalism in which one looks at people as self-orientalizing mm. but um, at the same time I find it really difficult not to consider people like say the in that <laughs> in the way in which I, I tend to think of Iqbal as a self-orientalizing individual as well. Um, I, I, I can't see where it's coming from. Whereas with someone like Tabatabai, it's very difficult to see it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Tabatabai, yes, he's he knows what the sort of challenges are in his context, but that's not his starting point or the his primary concern. His primary concern is what does it mean for me to be bearer of this tradition and having the responsibility to disseminate it mm. i think one that's one of the interesting things with Tabatabai is this idea that if i am a scholar i have a responsibility to help the next generation understand things in the way i do it mm. right? and, mm. and i think that's quite interesting now of course that's what arguably Nas would be saying and that's what Fadid, Fadid would be saying as well Fadid, it's interesting you brought in Fadid because he's like he's kind of the joker in this because <laughs> that's a good a way of people, looking I mean a lot of people have all sorts of issues with Fadid because yeah. partly because they're not really sure what you know who he is right because yeah. we know he was lots of different you know characters in lots of different contexts and certainly like he's, he's a master of personas and oh, it makes absolutely. it difficult to absolutely. pinpoint so, yeah and but what i think is interesting one thing which I, I think you pointed out which is interesting and this is where the the contrast lies is that arguably nasser is close to korba in this whole sense of um you know the the esoteric is a means for revealing fundamental hierarchies and structures which mm. are immutable, right? Mm. And at, at, the, at the pinnacle of which actually sits the monarch, right? So, mm. you know, Nasser is a monarchist through and through. We know that. In almost any context, he's a monarchist, whether it's Iran or Jordan, actually. We know he's a monarchist. <laughs> Right? That's true. He's a hardcore monarchist. If you ask him about Jordan, he'll say exactly the same thing. Um, <laughs> I didn't uh, know that. <laughs> he is. If you if you speak to him or any of his his circle about Jordan, they will consider the Hashemite monarchy as kind of expressing a metaphysical reality in the same way that the Shah and Iran did. Um, wow. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so um, but for someone like Farid, it's the opposite. So for, for Fardi, you know, it's it's almost like the the idea of this political spirituality you get in, in Foucault, you know, which oh, yeah. and expresses itself mm -hmm. in this um, republicanism, but a republicanism in which you don't really care very much for the the views of the general populace, right? Because mm -hmm. you you don't really respect their positions. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, you have a hostility to monarchy and you, you, you think that uh, a new possibility, a new revolutionary possibility arises out of the, out of the, the metaphysics, out of the esotericism. And mm -hmm. that's why with those, you know, like Faradid, I think the, perhaps the one who's closest, although he's quite different as well, as someone like Reza Davedi, um, who has written on, on Farabi, he's written on kind of um, 
uh, you know, a certain conception of how we you justify revolution and link it in with this kind of notion of the spiritual of, of, of the Ma'anawi. Um, so in, in some ways, basically, then you have like three models of thing of of Iranians who have some encounter with Korban, right? Mm, so exactly. I think with, with the NASA one, you've got a very strong um, con uh, sort of elements of continuity with some tweaking. With Faradi, I think he's also, the other thing I would say is maybe he's a magpie. So he's taking a bit from here and there. The, the, the one thing which I, I was surprised you didn't mention was Heidegger, because the, the key link between Korba and Faradi is Heidegger as well. There, um, there's much to say about this, yeah. more than 30 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> it just so, complicates so, um, the situation. That, that's one thing. But then, of course, you know, as I said, uh, after the revolution, Faradi, I think, presented himself in a very different way. Um, yeah. And uh, clearly a fascinating character because all of the accounts which have come out about him show that he was a highly charismatic and very cranky person, mm -hmm. right? But he had a huge influence uh, beyond the fact that he barely wrote anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what's really interesting. Um, and he actually owed his job at the Tehran University to Nasr. Um, I did not know that. that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't that know that. That was the one who appointed him as a professor of philosophy when NASA was the dean of, of the faculty. Um, and then and then I said, yeah, you've got this completely other um, vision with someone like what Tabatabai, in which mm. you've got philosophy has this important um, role to play in dealing with the intellectual challenges of the world and establishing metaphysical realism. The esoteric is primarily about the individual, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in a certain context. There's another question about the occult. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just gonna kind of <laughs> think that because we don't know much about that, but in terms of the legacies of Taba Tabai, we do mm -hmm. know at least one of the legacies is, is an occult legacy. Yeah. People very explicitly interested in formulae and um, I guess kind of what you would call spells and other mm -hmm. kinds of um, you know sort of um, practice, um, mm -hmm. which definitely does come out of of, of Taba Um and in in which um, you know formal politics then um, falls within this kind of classical model of Farabi, and and you see that in one of the you know I think one of the only works of Taba which we can really be sure that he did write on politics. Which is in 1962, he wrote a piece after the death of Ayatollah Burjadi, like many others did, in which he basically says, "Yeah, you know, it's obvious um, philosophers should be in charge, <laughs> right? It's as simple as that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, why would you have any other system?" Um, but philosophers, in a particular mode of understanding, um, you know, how they they um, reflect actually, interestingly, reflect. Um, popular sovereignty. And that's what's kind of interestingly um, uh, different in, in Tabata Bay. So sorry, I've, I've been ranting. Or sorry, yeah, ranting. <laughs> but um, I, I was just trying to kind of un, unpick, um, in a sense, some of the things you said, and then maybe expand it a bit. Um, yeah. So. Now, thank you so much for um, talking about Tabata Bay, because obviously this, this, this is, I mentioned, because I think there's a lot to be unpacked there. And um, so just a couple of things that I wrote down while you speak and I'll address them <laughs> randomly if you don't mind. So I think what you say about terminology and translab translab translatability is extremely important. And indeed the, the term Manawi I think carries a lot of things that can be introduced to this notion of Islamic esotericism and, and even what happens uh, when Manawi is used instead of Batan or instead of Ruhani or instead of mysticism. I don't, I never think it's random. I think it's a privileging of a hermeneutic and semiological mode of engagement. And it gives that the priority rather than a causal mode of engaging with nature, the celestial, the divine. So I think there's and, and it contrasts Manawi, and, and allow me here to revert to the Arabic, co will contrast with mustalah, right? With, with, with the term, which becomes the exoteric shell within which the mana is found. 
And this is something that has been discussed historically in, in many texts from like Ithna Ashari, Ismaili, like it's, it's a very important tension. And I, in fact, think the tension in itself is where Islamic esotericism resides. And um, especially, particularly the translinguistic element, because um, how can knowledge that is perceived as um, belonging beyond the realm of language, beyond the realm of discursive thinking, can be expressed in books, in talks, <laughs> you know, in, in lectures, and 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 in that way, the Manawi becomes indeed the Haqiqa and the Mustalah becomes the Sharia in some way. The Manawi becomes the esoteric and the Mustalah becomes the exoteric. And that's the limit of the Batin. That's the limit of the secret. That is li the limit of the Ma'na, that it needs a vessel for it to be communicated. So that's why in my a definition or in my studies of Islamic esotericism, secrecy in itself, I don't consider it as, as a, 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 a definitive characteristic of, of Islamic botany at all, because there's always this urge to put the manna in mustalah, always. While at the same time, maintaining the authenticity of a revelatory experience, by maintaining that it's a translinguistic one and that whatever I'm trying to express with mustalah, there is an inherent failure. But only those who have insight, only the imams, only spiritually elite who can lose that tension and live the ma'na without needing the mustalah. And I think that's precisely the, the point about training, right? In, in that sense, both the exoteric and the esoteric requires training. And sometimes people don't realize that. I mean, you can be exactly. trained in the esoteric in the, same, in the same way that you can be trained in doing tafsir, you can be trained in doing ta'wil. And, and I, I fundamentally don't understand go. why people think it's that mysterious in that sense, right? Mm. So now, obviously, one thing that that Corbin brings in and many others, I mean, Fevre does it in his work, is this whole idea, yes, but what about initiation, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's where the, the question arises. Well, what, what is initiation? Is, is it simply the fact that someone decides they want to be a student of someone else? Is that sufficient? You know, mm. what, what are the different, what are the various conditions required of mm. this process of initiation so that you can kind of um, have access to the, the practice of the arcana, arcana you know, as, mm. as I would say, so that you can understand the Kashf al and do mm. that process. Mm -hmm. I think the notion of initiation becomes more important in 19th century onward and in the understanding of Sufi tariqas, but also other esoteric Western currents that does require a very ritualized uh, initiation because I tend to steer away from reducing Islamic esotericism to one thing, one group, whether it was just the Sufis or just the Ismailis, etc. It, it makes initiation as a condition a problem because we don't have, like with, with the letterist, for example, with, with Ikhwan al-Safa, with other groups that I would consider esoteric, this notion of initiation in this formalized, ritualized way is not there. And so I also hesitated from putting that as one of the criteria for understanding Islamic esotericism. And the third one that I also didn't feel makes sense to be an intrinsic part of Islamic esotericism is the occult sciences. Now they intersected for sure, yeah. but I don't think they're the same thing. So if we accept that the occult sciences, historically speaking in Islamic sources have encompassed astrology, magic, divination, alchemy, and medicine in the middle ages, mm -hmm. then I, and, and they were like, part of like natural science and later letterism also came into into the picture more strongly and I but the astrology of Abu Mashar al-Balkhi in the 8th century was occult but not esoteric but the astrology of let's say Albuni it was both 
you know, occult and esoteric. And so because of that discrepancy, I thought that it's important to acknowledge their intersections, but that they're not the same thing. So for Guénon, the occult sciences are the original sciences. These are the traditional scientists, sciences that the West lost and therefore led to the demise of the spirit of, of the yeah. West. Um, and so he was calling for the use of astrology, but in his rehabilitation of the occult sciences, he explicitly cleanses it of all its like local Islamic elements. So he doesn't use kind of like medieval or early modern theorization of the occult. He immediately um, westernizes them at the same time as he uses them to to attack the spiritual demise of the West. So they do become proto-sciences. They do become um, very psychologized as well. And he explicitly rejects that occult sciences involves operations that like spells, if you, for lack of a better word, for riches, for um, getting a lover, for it's, and these were things that were in these books and he explicitly rejected them and psychologizes them. Which is an interest, which is ironic considering the way that he positions them to respond to to the spiritual demise, demise of the West. Uh, can I just make one comment before you come in, uh, Norman? I mean, yeah. this this question of the cult is interesting because my impression has always been that Corbin and also NASA do not take the occult very seriously. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't think NASA would even consider a cult to be science. Um, he has his own kind of... Um, no, I don't of, think so either, yeah. yeah. Um, so that kind of uh, very clear demarcation between, I guess, what we would call the esoteric and the occult is happening in their work in, mm. in a way in which I would argue that would not be the case in someone like Tabo Um ah. I mean, I wouldn't, for example, think that Batabai would openly talk about the, because occult is a different, it, it's a different um, circle, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. But it doesn't mean it's unrelated to mm. um, esotericism. Can I ask that. you, like, if I want to read more about yeah. Batabai's involvement with the occult sciences, where can I go? Uh, it's a difficult one. You have to, that's where you have to read. <laughs> You have to read personal accounts and memoirs and yeah. stuff because he really doesn't say much about it at all. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 about kind of reading uh, also what people he was associated with in Najaf were doing. So um, there are some now some works published by uh, you know claiming to be the works of his teacher Sayyid Ali Qadi mm. in, in, in Najaf. Um, as well as some of his, his students who are still in or more or have passed away in that sort of circles. Um, but, you know, that's where things like, um, you know, the, the concern with, with Jafar, uh, with um, Mujarrabat, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, comes up and you, you find that, I mean, these, uh, these things are kind of ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it is important to recognize, like you said, that the occult is a different circle with set of prejudices as well but also like they're, they're, it's very different and mm. and they're associated you know in our contemporary times with more superstitious you know charlatanry so i can understand how in the 20th century someone with that interest would keep it personal but, but I mean, to give you one quick example before we, I know Norman's waiting. Um, I have a book which I got a few years ago called um, something like Mujarrabat al Orafa, right? And it claims to be Mujarrabat associated precisely with people like Tabatabai. So it's got Tabatabai in there, it's got like some of his teachers in there, it's got his contemporaries in there. And um, you have everything from Tay al Ard to you know, whatever you can imagine. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, they are very kind of recognizable formulae, you know, mainly chronic verses, divine names, you know, um, magic squares, or like certain, you know, in, um, manipulations of numbers and letters. Mm -hmm. 
a very recognizable stuff, but here it's specifically saying these are the occult practices of the mystics or of people who are associated with that. This is way. fascinating. I would love to see that book. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, you could probably get it pretty much anywhere, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> certainly in shrine cities, that's where you get these things. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, over to you, Norman. Uh, there's there's no hurry. Uh, I think uh, Liana actually has been the most disciplined of all of our speakers. She finished quite quickly, so there's plenty of time. So if you want to go ahead, so John, I do have uh, a number of questions and comments. Uh, such a fascinating topic and such a fascinating discourse that we've had from Liana. Um, and you know, um, over the past couple of days here in Pakistan. Uh, the Prime Minister has appointed this guy, his name is Ijaz Akram, he's a professor, to this new authority that he's created called the Rahmatul Alameen Authority. And um, uh, this authority is supposed to uh, oversee curricular development. And this fellow, Ijaz Akram, uh, before he used to teach at LAMS and then he moved to the National Defense University. Um, and, you know, he, he's a friend of Alexander Dugan's. Uh, and mm -hmm. he's also, you know, uh, deeply um, influenced as a lot of people are actually, you know, in my own um, trajectory. So when I was in my A-level 17, 18, so it was uh, on the one hand, Idris Shah, and on the other hand, uh, Martin Lings and um, Rene Guénon, uh, Sean, these people, yeah. Um, and actually it was, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a military officer who introduced us to this. Uh, material. Um, now, the interesting thing is that, you know, so, I mean, uh, already what I'm saying indicates that, you know, the politics of this uh, is uh, quite reactionary. But what I find amazing about, uh, about it is that, um, I mean, after all, if these people are so uh, worked up about modernity, I am too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a catastrophe. Yeah? Uh, but uh, uh, if they're so worked up about modernity, the main agent of modernity is the state. And it's the, mm -hmm. the nation state, yeah, and they're totally invested in the state. I mean, um, there's no, I mean, whether it's a monarch, um, even Saudi Arabia, yeah, will have to claim, um, uh, will have to claim that uh, the legitimacy of the state rests in popular sovereignty. Yeah. Somehow, the state uh, sort of emanates from even the Saudi state. Even when you have uh, a military government in power in Pakistan, it is an, it is expressive of popular sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the uh, the uh, uh, the Constitution of Pakistan or the Objectives Resolution to begin with has this uh, stuff about uh, sovereignty belongs to God, but God literally this is what it says has delegated His sovereignty to the people of Pakistan. We don't know who He informed that He had delegated this sovereignty to the people of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the, he did, and and then of course, then whoever takes uh, up, uh, whoever takes control of the state, then expresses the sovereignty of the people. It's a kind of a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my first question is uh, uh, not just to you, to you know people who are listening and anybody right out there. How can you think that the state is going to get you out of this mess? when the state is in fact what is constantly producing this mess yeah uh, and is 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 the main agency uh, behind modernization what else is uh, you know nationalism is about or the modern nation state about um, and of course that it's closely tied so to my mind the you know in terms of the ontology of this the metaphysics of this uh, politics uh, to my mind it's this the the the, the nation state uh, is uh, totally uh, you know, collapses the transcendental and the imminent. Yeah, uh, uh, the distinction vanishes. It's a, it's a Hegelian, totally Christian kind of uh, development. So I don't know uh, how it is that they get to confuse um, modern Christian, yeah, post-Protestant, um, uh, post-Protestant uh, development. Um, so on the one hand, that's that's my thing. Yeah, is the how 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 so it also speaks to me of the fact that um, uh, modernization or modernity, in fact, uh, is so uh, is so dramatic and catastrophic and has so uh, far-reaching in terms of uh, the number of areas of social life, cultural life, cognitive life, 
everything has been colonized, that people are unable to see, um, uh, not surprisingly, I mean, we are, we are helpless in this regard. I really believe that we just don't have the cognitive abilities to process what has happened over the past couple of hundred years. Um, so to my mind, uh, you know, the fact that they can't see this Aryanism, which is utterly rampant. You know, there's this guy, Dr. Israr Ahmed, who's very, very influential uh, alim uh, in Pakistan and beyond Pakistan. Um, Hamza Yusuf, I think, also had something to do with it. But this guy also, you know, authoritatively, he said there are two people. There are two peoples in the world. They are the Semites and the Aryans. So this Aryanization also is utterly rampant in South Asia. This uh, Aryanism of uh, Sufism and esotericism, and of course, you're uh, as you said, you're absolutely right. It comes from um, it comes from these traditionalists, uh, etc. Yeah. Um, to my mind, the you know you guys know a lot more about this, but to my mind, the radical potential uh, of this to get to to get back to the politics, to my mind, it's uh, it's precisely because modernization or modernity is all about imminence and imminentism um, that uh, we need this ontology in order to be able to detach ourselves from um, uh, from this order. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the uh, that that's one of the things that I've been thinking about personally. You know, um, is that uh, this uh, this enables metaphysical realism? Yeah, uh, uh, should enable a detachment from the entire machine of modernity um, <laughs> and the primary primary you know agency of that machine or the primary sort of uh, a part of that machine is the state. It, it mm -hmm. is the machine. In fact, um, so those are some thoughts. The other, in terms of the phenomenological tradition, you know, there is this um, remarkable uh, quote that I came across um, from Husserl, uh, from the Crisis of the European Sciences, um, and uh, which was written, of course, in uh, in his encounter with Heidegger. It's uh, actually a kind of a response to Heidegger. Uh, he says something remarkable. Yeah, he says he says about the epoche because both in Heidegger and uh, before him in Husserl, it's not clear how it is that you can, uh, I mean, well, to begin with, with Husserl, how you, what it is that uh, you can do in order to perform this fundamental operation, which is the epoche. All phenomenology depends on performing the epoche. So how is it that you perform the epoche and what, what is the epoche? Because of course, there are no spiritual exercises, etc. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in phenomenology. Um, but he says, he says, perhaps it will come to light that the total phenomenological attitude and the corresponding epoche is called upon to effect by virtue of its essence, a complete personal transformation, Wandlung, he says, which might be compared to a religious conversion, but which even beyond this bears within itself the significance of the greatest existential conversion that is given to humanity as its task. Yeah, this is the kind of apocalyptic and es eschatological possibility uh, that I would see. Uh, as having this, uh, you know, have, as having a radical and decolonial uh, politics. Yeah? Mm. Mm -mm. So those are some thoughts. That I, uh, <laughs> Th thank you, thank you for for sharing these thoughts. I mean, I, I I've reached a place in my research which is which might change, but that there wouldn't be esotericism without claims of authority of one way or the other. Um, and and so that's on a more like, let's say, historical wide historical uh, context. But I also like it's it's very difficult the question that you're asking. Like, how can we negotiate our presence in nation states and also have these eschatological concerns, whether on a personal or a communal level? Because you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm stating the obvious, but you know, the, the state and the and authorities in general, they were constantly seek to establish and reestablish some sort of orthodoxies, right? And and in our case, in the case of the nation state, these orthodoxies are based on modern ideologies, so they're they're on terms other than those of the colonized. It's the terms of the colonizer. So how can you function? within these structures and maintain a kind of esotericism, like, um, how can I put it? A better way of looking at it is that 
perhaps the discourse about the ascendance of the soul, the restitution of communities, also include in it a kind of fundamental transformation of political structures, and that this is part of it. It's and this is the more, I think, Sharia part. This is where the exoteric and the law comes in and the reactions to that take place. So it's, 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 a, it's a dilemma. It's a, it's a very strong dilemma, but perhaps that's, that's the restitution of the community is a more involved imagining of alternative, perhaps even inspired by esoteric tenants, who knows, but <laughs> I, I definitely do not have the answer for, for, the, for, for your question, but in terms of esotericism, it's like al-batin, al-bataniya, although it refers to the, what, you know, the al-batin al-zahir as the name of uh, God, but also the, the interpretations of the Quran and, and, and the relationship between the imams and people, I also think that it, it needs authority. It needs someone to take hold of esotericism and claim, claim orthodoxy for an esoteric reaction. So it seems to be the story that you have esotericists and you have these questions from Ikhwan al-Safa to, to, as I said, to more contemporary uh, thoughts about that question. Mm. Um, you know, on the question of authority, so I, uh, I mean, may, there are many different forms of authority. Yeah, so, um, you know, there I have this, the quote that's coming to my mind, I, I can't remember it was, if it was Blanchot who said to Bataille or Bataille said to Blanchot, one of them said to the other that uh, all uh, genuine authority expiates itself. So, so this expiation, which is not a part of this kind of nation state cannot expiate anything. Uh, the uh, uh, modern state authority cannot expiate anything. You can't uh, expect uh, any kind of, uh, uh, what should one say, voluntary, um, voluntary surrender or denudation of authority uh, on mm -hmm. the part of the state. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the problem for me is not, uh, uh, problem for me personally is not authority as such. Um, it's a, the particular form that authority takes, which is, uh, which is not really authority. It's, a, in, it, it's mm -hmm. in fact authoritarianism. I don't think we can, um, you know, conflate authority and authoritarian uh, because, you know, there are many different forms of authority. And without a concept of legitimate authority, I mean, this is something that Gaudama, a point that Gaudama makes, um, in, in which he talks about uh, the Enlightenment's prejudice against prejudice, but then also talking about authority, he says, well, I mean, the idea of legitimate authority, without that, there's no concept of authority to begin with. So authoritarian, I mean, even the, the fact that we call the word authoritarian as if authority is necessarily authoritarian, yeah. Mm. <laughs> there's no there's no such necessity i don't think True. Sure. yeah i mean mm. um, the, i mean in our own homes the way we were i mean uh, we were brought up for instance you know the uh, a child is necessarily existentially confronted with uh, authority yeah <laughs> i mean so you're not going to ask your um, you know the, you're not going to ask your child okay please tell you know teach me teach me the language uh, you know, there's no, uh, when you come into the world, there is, but the question is what form it takes. And um, amongst all of these uh, characters, uh, you, you find, you find a, a, a kind of fetishization or reification uh, mm -hmm. of authority. Anyway, more importantly, there's a, there's a, a question from our friend, Noor, ah. uh, Noor Sobas Khan, Dr. Noor Sobas Khan. And she says, hi, friends. Uh, thanks for a great talk and discussion. I want to ask about the intersection between the dissemination of traditionalist writings with their em embedded Aryanist assumptions and their popularity in South Asia mm. and the question of class in the post-colonial nation state. 
Uh, it's something we've talked about in person, but I'm curious to hear your responses in conversation together. Mm -hmm. Intersection between the dissemination of traditionalist writings with their embedded Aryanist assumptions and their popularity in South Asia and the question of class in the post-colonial nation state. Mm. I, uh, Sajad, would you like to take? Uh, I mean, in a sense, that's precisely what we were indicating, wasn't it? But, um, um, the Iranian context, of course, we're, we're talking about Nasr and Fadid, um, who share the same kind of elitist assumptions, um, same ideas, I guess, of initiation <laughs> as someone like uh, like Corbin. Um, and they would not, for example, necessarily recognize the everyday spiritual practices Precisely. of the person in the past uh, in the, uh, to have at all the same authority or even authenticity as theirs, right? And similarly, when you look at the traditionalists, I mean, we know specifically who the traditionalists are in the Pakistani context. You've got the people like Sohail Omar, you know, the, the direct people associated with, with Nasser and, and many other kind of academics and, uh, you know, writing um, in English. Um, and of course, the fact that you're writing and engaging primarily in English in the Pakistani context already says something about class, already says something about the sort of the social privilege that one has. Precisely. Um, just not recognizing um, any notion of, of um, a spiritual engagement or consociality or conviviality that you would have, say, at a shrine. In, exactly. In Pindu, etc. They just wouldn't recognize that as being the same thing. Um, Absolutely. Uh, even though um, I personally would say what's happening in the shrine is far more authentic <laughs> than what they're engaging in because it's actually rooted in their embedded kind of, it's, it's rooted in their culture and it's, it's part of everyday life in the way in which, you know, reading Genon is not part of kind of everyday life in, in, in some way. Or Shuan, you know, you, you see all the books that have been published by the Iqbal Academy. Mm. Um, you know, um, these are all books which are written, uh, which are basically read by a very small elite of people. Um, it's a nice thing to have on your shelf. I, I know I have lots of friends in Pakistan that have those books on their shelves. Um, it, it, it's, it's almost like a group belonging. Um, and it can also, uh, uh, I think increasingly, especially with the current government of Pakistan, it also indicates some sort of political affiliation as well. Mm, 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 mm. I, I agree with what you say. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned in, in, in my talk was that, um, that Korban viewed politics as drama of the flesh and that this is not where the focus should be at all. And it is in the enfleshed embodied practices that he, I, I doubt that they would be interested in that part. And in fact, the traditional saw these explicitly. I mean, they did say that about Buddhists, about Hindus and about Sufis and about shrine culture, actually, that these were a um, a degeneration of Islam, a degeneration of Buddhism, a degeneration of Hinduism, and that it is their job to um, elevate this back to this truthful situation, which is indeed very elitist, because also this this political silence that I talked about it's it's a privilege. It's the privilege of the elite to participate in in in, in political institutions, but have that privilege to be reticent about it and so to be to to get down and dirty with the shabby part is never part of that vision i think in especially in the works of the traditionals and i'm not convinced that korban would have been either interested in that because he's not concerned with the enfleshed the embodied that which stinks that which smells and you know he I'm sure he stayed away from that. And if he didn't, he romanticizes it. He fetishized it and saw it as part of that mystical East, which him as a European scholar would, would, would elevate or would, high, would, would bring back to, 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 not to Muslims, but to, 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 to Europe. And I think this is also where the occult sciences have this weird position because the occult sciences will always be associated with Mushabid, Diramal, and those are 
agents who work on other classes on you know more quote unquote lower classes that wouldn't that wouldn't interest the traditionalists or Corban. And perhaps these would be viewed as a sign of the, the, uh, the, the, the degeneration of practices, embodied practices that we see in shrines, that we see in a lot of Shabi Sufi groups as well. In fact, that's what, something which I've often thought about is, um, you know, all the writings about Corban and I've never come across any reference to him actually ever having gone to Khom or to Mashhad or to Shah Abdul Azim, um, which, is, which is interesting. I mean, if you look at um, uh, Shairan's work, and of course Shairan was part of that circle, there mm -hmm. is uh, at one point a very brief conversation that he has actually interestingly with Paul Ricoeur, where they talk about going to Mashhad, to the shrine. Mm. But never anything about Corbin. And actually, even in that case, we don't really know whether he took Ricoeur to the shrine in Mashhad and what, you know, what might have, you know, transpired. Um, but uh, that's one element. And then I think another element is the way in which, um, you know, different shrines work as well. I mean, in a Pakistani context, I would say even there's class effects shrines. So some shrines are kind of middle class, respectable, mm, that's you know, true. kind of like state institutions, um, and others are, you know, absolutely the opposite. So you know, uh, everything from the simple thing of, do you smell weed as soon as you get there, or do you not? Right? <laughs> um, are things? Uh, how are things um, um, uh, presented? You know, what sort of guidance are you given uh you know in the in the vicinity and so forth and and this of course happens in many other shrines across the muslim world as well there, there are exactly. shrines which are kind of official and state-sponsored and very sanitized and ones which are not mosques uh, too ex absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. Mm. Yeah. by the way um uh, th these guys who publish uh, all this um traditionalist stuff here in Pakistan, the Swahil Academy, they don't publish any Korba. Not a single book by Korba. They but then I, but is a, I assume that's an English thing, isn't it? Because um, I don't think, there's not very much Korba which is in translation, is there? Um, there's quite I mean, there's a bit. Some, no, no, there's lots. Some, yeah. Actually, there's no, no, yeah. No, I, yeah. Keep we don't have on Islam Irania out of the thing. Yes, of course you're right. There are, but mm -hmm. um, there might be different kinds of um, permissions. Yeah, but that's true. Actually, they haven't done um, like his major works on on Avicenna or Ibn Arabi or any of that stuff. You're right. Okay. I think that's, the, or even the books on on comparative philosophy, which uh, do exist in English. Uh, yeah. Can, can you can can we just like go back to Noor's question about the, the popularity in South Asia? I mean, Norman mentioned about this kind of like inadvertent or advertent, I don't know, um, Ar 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 Aryan um, uh, self identification, perhaps. But I, I am very interested in in the the part of the question about their dissemination, their teaching, and in in South Asia, and this is something I would I would like to hear more oh, I mean, about. As as Sajad is also saying, uh, you know, it's uh, it's very elitist. It's uh, very very. Uh, uh, I mean, the people who read this uh, material, uh, you know, often military officers, uh, etc., and you know, small groups of people. I mean, they can also be. Um, they can they can often be more liberal, so they, um, you know, they 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 wouldn't be so hard on the minorities, or except for perhaps the Ahmadis, yeah. Apart mm. from, um, um, but in terms of the other religions, they're obviously a lot more uh, open to that. Um, unlike, say, you know, followers of Madhudi, uh, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. So they, once again, it's you know, so they, they've got something going for them uh, in that regard. Um, but generally, they are extremely elitist and authoritarian mm -hmm. and reactionary and all, all of yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a completely different kind of culture that emerges from the shrines. Not not that they're all shrines are useful. By the way, are there any shrines where you would smell 
weed if you went to a shrine. Obviously, that's not the case in either Mashhad or Qom, but are there other? <laughs> I mean, unlike in Pakistan. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> there are, there are, there are. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, one thing I de definitely remember from a visit a number of years ago is that um, it was very easy to get these Sohail Academy books in Islamabad much more than it was in Karachi or Lahore. And I think that tells you something because it's the capital, it's where, you know, you've got bureaucrats, you've got the military elites, um, the right. senators. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you have these books on shelves of senators and people like that. Um, yeah. In, well, in I some, mean, some bookshops, you know, that is the, the whole Islam section that is precisely these books. Yeah, yeah. Well, even here in Karachi, I mean, it's a very impoverished, as you know, very impoverished uh, scene. There are hardly any bookstores, etc. But whatever bookstores you have, they always have these Sohail Academy books um, uh, in the in the religious, uh, the traditionalists. That's what, you know, your average, I guess it's also, you know, the thing that's continuing from Iqbal also, in some sense, mm. uh, that pushes them in that direction. In fact, this Sohail Omar guy who was the uh, director of this, he was also the director of the uh, Iqbal Academy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, they also used to bring out something in Urdu. They used to bring out a journal in Urdu called Rivayat. Mm. Rivayat, which, uh, you know, tradition. Yeah. So, uh, and Askri, so very interesting figure, very, very influential in terms of um, the trajectory of Urdu literary critical uh, tradition. Uh, after partition, especially the guy used to be first. He started out with the Progressive Writers Movement, and you know, allied allied with socialists, etc. And then um, he was a modernist, so uh, he was a student of French literature, Baudelaire, etc. Um, and then he, uh, through his discovery of Guénon, uh, Martinings, etc., Sean, through his discovery of the traditionalists, he moved in the direction of theology. Uh, but the politics there was interesting because he supported, uh, even during the Zia years, he supported, um, he supported Bhutto, not, uh, not uh, General Zia. So he was mm -hmm. a, de you know, Democrat in that sense. Uh, when his student moved to the Jamaat Islami, he completely uh, boycotted him and never saw his face ever again. So the politics also is a, some, you know, a little, some, it can be a li little bit complicated. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not, a, uh, it's not that uh, straightforward, but in general, I think it's true that they are, uh, they've had a, uh, a very nefarious actually influence in politics. And I, I think it's actually uh, the metaphysics, the, the metaphysics actually has much more uh, potential than um, their metaphysics has much more radical potential and uh, radical implications than these people themselves realize. I think they're mistaken uh, in the way that they understand the implications of this metaphysics. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that also raises the whole question of how, um, you know, how you can actually use Geno and Paul Bath for decolonization. So, um, you know, I mean, one, one obvious kind of, uh, if, if one just looked at, you know, the first part of the title of your talk today, Decolonizing Botania, mm -mm. right? One could say, okay, um, the problem we have with the term Botania in the modern period is that, first of all, there's an assumption that there is no such thing as the Botan. Um, so it's opening up the possibility. And the second one is when we think about the Botan, we, we probably think of words like irrational, right? <laughs> irrational or kind of like fantasy or you know something which is unreal yeah. um, and so at that level there it, it's it's quite useful uh, but also I mean I'm thinking now of uh, you know Wael Halak's previous book yeah where he actually uses Geno uh, precisely yes. to make an argument against orientalism um, uh, and and it's a, it's a classic decol decolonial um, move because. Do you, you know, mean the impossible the impossible state? No, no, the, the one about um, um, re rethinking Orientalism. Uh, rethinking, yeah, yeah, the rethinking Orientalism or something yeah, exactly. like something obvious. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so one one of the chapters is about Geno. Yeah, and, that's true. I mean, of course, 
you know, it'd take us very long to get into who Halak is and what he's doing and all this other stuff. But it, that's a fascinating use of Geno. Because yeah. it's using Geno to say, this is a different way in which we look at the colonial enterprise. And this is, uh, and, and he's actually saying that uh, Geno is a decolonial thinker. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, and- I, do, I do think it's interesting and I'm not necessarily convinced. <laughs> Yeah. And the well, reason why yeah. I'm not I'm not convinced because not because of the idea of itself of using the ideas of Geno and whatever to 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 reclaim, but more because I think in in that book I was struck by the 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 kind of rehashing of what I consider, with all respect, the naive a binary of like a good Orientalism and a bad Orientalism. And there's a lot of that I felt that was underlying the argument, but you know how to use Geno and Corban in a decolonial project. I think, as I said, it wasn't. I, I don't think they should be cancelled at all. Um, they are extremely relevant, and they're extremely relevant to Islamic esotericism as we understand that today. It has become part of the trajectory of the development of Islamic esotericism. I think it's a good place to start by um, re-emphasizing the, I think, one, okay, one way of doing it is to research, I think, more their relationship with the Sufi masters who initiated them. Uh, this has not, I, in my, you know, as far as I know, I, this has not been done. It would be interesting to look Especially, especially since both sheikhs had inve- had interest in the question of modernity and what it's doing to the youths, and so we need to have that conversation be a bit clearer. Like, what what was that relationship like? I think that is a good point. The second thing would be to understand them as moments of important moments of entanglement with that historical construct, thus becoming part of that trajectory. And seen in that way, I don't think we need to like, not include them in the story in in the same way that we wouldn't exclude, you know, converts, we wouldn't exclude um, Western Sufism as part of the of the conversation it's just i feel like it needs to be set within the 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 the, the historical construction of al batim and interrogated in that way but not to de- not to dismiss and not to um, include in the conversation but put it in 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 its right context I've always said, use them more as primary text about that moment of entanglement rather than a secondary text about Islam as a whole. Yeah. I, I, th- I think that's fair. And, 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 uh, and certainly the fact that, you know, we're talking about two figures who are, are really major in terms of modern Islamic. Exactly. I mean, you know, um, uh, so obviously their impact on these to European figures is a minor mm. element of their wider impact. Mm. Uh, and, and you could even say the same thing about, you know, the circles who um, uh, in the generation of say Nasser's father, uh, but also, you know, his the people he claims as his own teachers, you know, including Allah, I mean, mm. you've got the Qazim Asad, you've got uh, Mehdi Laif Qom Shahi, you've got a number of other figures who were very prominent in, um, in Iran in the fifties and sixties, um, you know, traditionally trained, uh, seminary trained, um, involved in, in spirituality of different sorts, involved in philosophy, etc. And um, uh, interestingly, in recent years, a lot of their works are being published um, in Iran. In, in the, and, and some of these works are interesting because they, they are, um, you know, the, some of the first major steps in engagement with European thought. Uh, you know, so if you want, like, for example, really serious engagement with Kant, you read someone like Mehdi Haidi Yazdi, um, you know, who is more uh, slightly older. He's an older contemporary of, 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 um, of Nasser, but they definitely knew each other. Um, uh, same thing goes for Mehdi Alayi um, one of the first people to write a, a textbook of philosophy, which was then used at Tehran University. You know, so, so these are, are major figures and they... Mehdi Laik Khomshahi was also 
remains the most popular, one of the most popular translators of the Quran into Persian. Mm. Uh, you know, wrote on very famous collections of du'as, both him and Sha'arani, who was again part of that circle, um, uh, did translated Sahih Sajjadiya, wrote works on this, you know, these are major devotional texts. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's that wider kind of circle, um, which is really important as well. I think so too. And it's really, it's just subject for very interesting research that I think will balance the narrative a little bit more. You also mentioned how the Baten is perceived nowadays in relation to the irrational. I think it's important to to unpack this a little bit because um, it's, 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 it's irrational because when you subject it to a sort of post enlightenment values and construct of science and religion then 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 that would be the case it would, they, they, they said esotericism and the occult sciences are according to that scheme irrational and superstitious and um, not worthy of scholarship however i also the same way that i argued that albatani and esotericism is a long, like a construct with a long history dating back a long time ago. I think it should not be necessarily only assessed to like science and religion of the 19th and 20th century, but to the other two constructs that also had huge long history, which is Deen and Ilm. And Roshayn Abbasi talks about Deen as an Islamic construct and Harun Kujuk talks about Ilm as well in that way. And I think we would understand it better when we look at our sources and see how it fits in that way. And certainly in my work on Jabir ibn Hayyan, and that's like a long time ago, like this negotiation of al batin with Deen al-Ilm is explicit. Like he in, in Kitab al-Nukhab that I'm working on right now, this is like literally spilled, spelled out why he doesn't talk about al batin in this context, but he talks about al batin in that context. And it's completely tied in with his understanding of Elm and Deen. And, and he even gives wonderful definitions of Deen. He chastises people who think that people of Deen are not people of Aql. You know, so the, all of these tensions that we associate with like modern time and post enlightenment, this construct, way predates all of them and it's better to understand the tension between bat and zahir haqiqa sharia all of that within these also like homegrown so to speak constructs of deen and 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 ilm. And, and in fact that's precisely why i think it's properly decolonial because you're trying to go beyond the binary right? exactly uh, i try my best and, um, i mean to get to just to kind of one last sort of comment for me um it's like the classic thing, you know, um, I don't know why in what context this came up, we're having, I was at a conversation with a bunch of people who do history of philosophy, and someone kind of as a mocking kind of aside said, you know, um, what, what do the alchemists think they're doing? I mean, it was really stupid to think they could actually produce gold, right? And now to me, that's interesting, because it, it raises the whole question of what they think the alchemists are doing. Right? Mm, yeah, uh, you know, and what does it even mean to produce gold? Mm. So it gets into a whole kind of other thing. You know, what is elm? What is techne? What is you know, um, uh, what what is the metaphysics beyond it, etc. I mean, it's it's um, and 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 I kind of juxtapose that with a conversation I had with a friend who who you will know and and Norman knows as well a long time ago, who said to me, you know, of course it is entirely possible to make gold. But the conditions for it are very, very t- tough, and I don't think I can do them. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but those are two diametrically different ways of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 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 beyond definitions, what are the purpose of experimentation in 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 these times? What what what? I mean, I've I've always seen, for example, theoretical. Uh, investigations into astrology and astral magic to be very much concerned with action at a distance. It's trying to understand the concept of action at a distance. Aristotle said that cannot happen. And yet we see the magnet work a certain way. We see the stars working a certain way. So how can we understand action at a distance? 
divination often spoken about in terms of hadz intuition yeah. so the, the, so despite the difference in the science the mm -hmm. phenomena of uh, that 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 sets this curiosity is is universal i mean i'm you know that intuition versus evidence based diagnosis is a huge philosophical debate in medicine and the question of action at a distance you know quantum physics astrophysics these are still concerns like at the heart of 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 science so on i so i i I, I, I like I like zooming into these questions, like the phenomena they're grappling with, rather than the end result, um, whether that was gold or soul sublimation. I think yeah. that is safer for the historian who's like studying the work of dead people. <laughs> to that's the uh, that's the safer approach. Uh, especially since you know, I mean, the the follow up to that comment was like, surely it's a sign of madness to repeatedly do some something when you know it's not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, no mind. Shall we? Shall we wrap things up because we've we've taken a lot of yeah. I know this time. is uh, this is so stimulating and so great, and there's so much to talk about. Thank you so much. But uh, you know, alas, it's uh, uh, we're almost uh, two hours into our discussion. One hour forty five minutes. Yeah. So the recording is going to be well, anyway. Um, Thank you for uh, for speaking to us, Liana, today, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, yes. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, it's a really, I think, an excellent way to conclude our terms uh, series of, of seminars. Yes. Um, and uh, we will, of course, be back in the new year um, on, I think, the 7th of January it is, with my colleague from Exeter, Raha Rafi, who will be talking about non-normative bodies uh, within the context of Islamic law and how we look at uh, law and spirituality. So um, hopefully everyone will join us uh, then. And we will, of course, uh, at some point in the near future, um, put out the program for next term as well so that people know uh, what's going to be happening. But we will, uh, just to say at this stage, there will continue to be a fortnightly seminar like this on, on Facebook um, going forward. So sure. uh, uh, yeah. join us and uh, thank you, um, Liana, again. Thank and, you so much, Liana. Well, thank you so uh, much for having me. This has been great. It's great to see you. Good to see you. And too. thank you for everyone who tuned in. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Salam alaikum. Uh,